Would you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2? Colossians chapter 2, if you need a Bible, go ahead and just stick your hand right up and we'll have one brought out to you. Uh, I've personally been so blessed by our study through Colossians and... uh, I don't know why, maybe it's just me, but I almost feel like Colossians is kind of a, a forgotten book a little bit in the New Testament, man, but we are, it's resonating with me as we've been making our way through and what Paul has been doing in this letter. We're going to be in chapter 2, finishing chapter 2 of Colossians, uh, but the, Paul, the Apostle Paul has been encouraging this young church in Colossae and At the same time, he's been encouraging us to trust Jesus. Even if those around us question the authority and the sufficiency of who Jesus is, he's encouraged us. And would you just remember, for each of you, Jesus is sufficient. He's enough for you. You don't need to add anything else. And as we said last week, if you were with us, we read in verse 10 that he's head he is the authority over all, all principalities and power. And he is the one who makes you right with God. And uh, to continue that kind of that, if you guys were here, that uh, illustration with the water pitcher that we had last week, wh- when we added more things to what Jesus had done, it actually takes away. We think, well, I'm going to add this thing uh, to my relationship with the Lord, and then I'm going to be, you know, this is what's going to make me right with God. Or, or we think this is going to make me more right with God. But when we add to what Christ has already done at Calvary, that finished work, what we're doing is we're diminishing what he has done. He's done enough. It's sufficient. And so by adding our own efforts, our own religious practices, that's exactly the kind of false teaching that made its way into the church in Colossae. And uh, there's just all these other things out there, these voices that, that they heard. And they needed help as young believers to navigate through all that. Like, how, do, what, how does this fit with what I've learned about Jesus and who he is? And so to wrap our minds around this passage that we're going to look at um, and to really, I think, apply it to our own life, we need to understand and remind ourselves again of the context, uh, that the, the situation in which the Colossians were living. And certainly in doing so, what we're going to find is that we can make some very real comparisons to the day that we're living in. But again, we're going we're gonna to get to it. We're going to study too much. I hope it doesn't feel too much like school, but it's after Labor Day, so uh, class is in session, I guess. Um, but these pressures that they faced, all these different voices telling them, you know, you got to add this to your Christianity and add this to your Christianity. We're going to just kind of work our way through some of those things. And, uh, and the first that thing that we're going to point out is that they lived in a society filled with cultural paganism. They, they lived in a culture in, here in the mid-first century that was filled with immorality. Sometimes we think, like, you know, if we've been to the Strip or something, I was just on Bourbon Street about a month and a half ago. I was like, man, we, we own the rights on immorality, right? But that stuff's been around a long, around a long time. And so uh, slavery, as uh, Paul mentioned a few weeks ago when he was up here, two-thirds of the Roman Empire were, were slaves. Uh, and then sexual sin was just out of control. Homosexuality, uh, pedophilia, nothing was off limits in, in Roman culture. Seriously, nothing sexually was off limits. So they had all of that that they're dealing with, all this just rampant, immorality everywhere, okay? We can kind of relate with that, okay? Again, I was at Bourbon Street. Trust me, you don't need to prove it yourself. We should have avoided it altogether. But anyway, I I digress. Uh, So they're dealing with that. And then secondly, and you guys probably studied this when you were in school, like sixth grade or something, you know, they they still had all of this this stuff with... uh, not Bourbon Street. You didn't study Bourbon Street in sixth grade. That's wrong. Well, these today's textbooks, they are. Now I'm digressing even more, okay? But 
the, uh, the Roman gods, right? Jupiter, Juno, Mars, Venus, all of that. The list goes on and on, and there was uh, sacrifices and worship to those. And then they also had emperor worship. And, uh, and so that, that was born out of, obviously, just pride and arrogance. Uh, Caesar Augustus. Augustus means, you know, the, the kind of like the high and exalted one. And, uh, and so he promoted this, and it, it's extended on now to the, by the time that Paul writes this to Colossians. And, and they said it was to unite the, this kingdom, the, the empire. You know, the empire is expanding, and we need people to show their solidarity and not just pledge allegiance to the empire, but to the emperor himself. And if they didn't, well, they faced possible punishment, right? That was a very real thing. If you don't, if you don't uh, say that Caesar is Lord, man, you could put yourself in a dangerous position. And so they, they dealt with all of this cultural paganism. And that alone, man, there's so many things going on, lots of stuff coming at them. And then along with that, the second thing I'm going to mention is ascetic Gnosticism. And that really does sound like we're in school, but the ascetic part is, is this refusing of sensual pleasures, especially in the area of sex and food. And uh, he's going to mention that specifically down in verse 21 when we get there. But this teaching was that if there's something physical, it's a distraction from what you could be receiving spiritually. So every, every physical thing that you added in your life, it's almost like you're excluding, it's like this dualism type of thing that you're excluding something spiritual. So like the less you have, the more you could have type of thing, okay? So that's the aesthetic part. The Gnostic part, and again, Gnostic, it's from the same uh, word we get, knowledge. Gnostics taught that salvation came through just an awakening of your understanding, to have your eyes open to deeper truths that you didn't understand before. And as I was going through this and studying this and, and reading about Gnostics and all of that, you, quite literally, if, if you defined today what it is to be woke, you know, uh, you're getting very close to what Gnosticism is. It really is not that far apart. And it's just religious uh, thinking. It's outdated. It's old-fashioned. You could just stay away from that. And we're learning, and we're becoming more technically advanced, and, and, uh, and so we're becoming more of who maybe we were made to be, right? This is good for humanity. A lot of the same type of vibe that's around today. And it, but they also had some of this like new age type stuff, and there's visions, and uh, there's this whole realm of angelic beings that they thought were kind of interme intermediaries between this great divine power and us that they had to uh, have a relationship with. So just lots of junk, lots of stuff. And so they have all this cultural things going on, and then they have this ascetic Gnosticism. And then third, there were those that pressured Christians to live according to this Jewish religious roots thing, okay? If you follow the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament, you got to make sure that you're doing things the Jewish way. You got to worship the Jewish way, and you need to perform. You need to wear the right things. You need to have the right, you know, code of conduct. You need to eat the right things, all of that. And so the Colossians, this is just a lot. They're new Christians, and I'm like, I, I, how do I digest this? I just, I trusted Jesus in faith, I place my faith in him. Now, what do I do with all of this? All of this paganism and uh, ascetics and Gnostics and uh, Jewish religious roots. Like, how does this fit together? Does it fit together? And guys, this isn't something that just was, uh, well, this was an issue back in, you know, uh, 60 AD or so when Paul wrote this, whatever. We can find ourselves hearing the same voices and being in the same difficult spot. I, I, no I noted this in my Bible. If you mark up your Bible, I, it's what I do, man. It's all different colors. But in, in chapter 2, verse 4, Paul said, I say this lest anyone should deceive you. And then he said in verse 8, beware lest anybody cheat you. Today we're going to look at, in verse 16, he says, let no one judge you. Verse 18, again, let no one cheat you. Man, there's voices out there, and they're trying to keep us from understanding and knowing the simplicity of Jesus, and he's enough. And this is still going around today. 
Uh, you, you may think, well, I mean, I grew up uh, praying to Mary. Man, is that, where does that fit into this? Or uh, I've got this uh, Seventh-day Adventist friend, and they say that you should be worshiping on Saturday, not Sunday, because Sunday is named after the sun. And if you're worshiping on Sunday, really what you're doing is worshiping the, the sun. And, and then, you know, maybe like we do, maybe you've got friends that are J-Dub or, or uh, uh, LDS or something, and they're like, well, you know, the Trinity's not even in the Bible, and they're taking away from the, the deity of Jesus. And, and, and now, man, maybe you've got folks, and this is super popular today, we're hearing, well, Jesus was a Jew, and, and he was Jewish, and he did practice the, the things that we read in there, so you've got to go back to your Jewish roots. Man, there's just so much stuff out there. Maybe there is another testament. Maybe there is something more. Maybe my eyes do need to be open to this other thing. And this stuff can affect every single one of us. It can, it can cheat us. It can deceive us. It can do all of those things. And I'll just add, you know, just personally, just a, like about, about a month ago, my, my brother, my older brother, uh, grew up in the same home I did, Christian school, went to church his, his whole life, and he decided about a month ago, he told my, our family, told my mom, he's like, I'm going to live according to the Jewish roots now, and uh, uh, I can't, I'm not going to be able to share meals with you if I, if I don't know exactly what's in them, and if you do something from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, I can't participate, and he's just excluding himself from family because I'm going to live by this. This stuff is everywhere. And it's out to get every single one of us, all these different voices, all these distractions. And so Paul is like, let's just go back to the basics. We need to get our eyes back on Jesus. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it what? abundantly. I want you to have abundant life, and it comes from me. And so Paul says, let's get our eyes off of all of those distractions, all those other voices that are so loud at times, and let's get our eyes back on Jesus. Let's not compliment, compliment, let's not complicate this abundant life that Jesus has offered us that's found in him. And so with that kind of you know, schooly background. Let's uh, pick up in verse six, and Paul says, "You therefore, or excuse me, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him." Okay, we looked at these verses last week. If you're with us, but it's when you began this walk of this thing called Christianity, you believed that you heard about Jesus, and you simply believed that who he was and what he was, has done was enough to save you from your sin and your shame. Just simple faith. He says, you received Jesus, he says, as Christ the Lord, as Christ is the one who saves. It's the Messiah. You, you believe that Jesus could save you, and he's Lord. He's going to be master of my life. You just simply believe that. And now, then, at the very end of that, he says, so walk in him. Don't complicate it. You began in simple receiving faith, now just keep walking in him. And this is so much of the Christian life. So much of the Christian life is just faithfully saying, I'm going to receive what you have and I'm just going to walk. I'm going to walk one foot in front of the other, one step at a time. I'm going to prioritize being with God's people. I'm going to take that step in simple faith because you've said it's what I need. I'm going to take that step and put myself where I'm studying your word. Not what people think about your word. I'm going to study your word because you said man, this is going to bless me. It's going to deepen and strengthen my life. I'm going to take another step, and I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to start my day with devotions, and I'm going to be praying for my family, and just step by step by step. As you receive Jesus, walk in him. Take these steps, and then you can almost see the progression in verse 7. Once you do, man, you're rooted, he says, built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. There is so many other voices. There's so much other stuff out there and messages, and we just live in this information age, and we're inundated with all of these things. But I'll tell you what, these adjectives right there, rooted, built up, established, these are the type of people our world is looking for right now. I pray that they find these people in the, from the church because they, they aren't going to find them anywhere else. They need to find this in, in the Christian, that someone like, man, there's so much stuff that is going on there, but man, that person is rooted. They are strong. They're not going whatever way the wind blows. This is right. This is wrong. This is, man, they just know exactly what truth is. They're sticking to it, and they're not wavering. And then they're, they're, they're abundantly joyful. 
The world is telling us not to be joyful. Here's all the things you should be fearful of. Here's all this. And man, we're sticking out because we're not only are we rooted and built up and established, but man, we're cheerful. Even if the media tells us we shouldn't be, man, we've got Jesus. He saved me. Man, I have everything that I could possibly want. God is so good to me, abundantly cheerful. But as we said, okay, we're still making our way through here. There's real challenges. And so he warned them in verse 8, beware, lest anyone cheat you <clears throat> through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. He says, don't let anybody cheat you. There's lots of stuff out there. All you need is Jesus. Why? Verse 9, for in him, again, I hope we have this underlined, for in him, even if you have a loner Bible, go ahead and underline this for the next person. In him, that is Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that makes up divinity is in Jesus. And verse 10, you are complete or you're filled in him who is the head of all principality and power. All of God is in Jesus and we're filled in him. And so in, instead of uh, receiving the fullness, this is the danger for the church and for us, instead of receiving all that fullness that's available to us in Jesus, the pressure is to, to, to grab that thing and to, and to hear and, and grab a hold of this too. And it's all these things that won't fulfill us. Man, but those voices are allowed, right? And so Paul is going to explain, here's what it means to be full. Here's what it means to be complete in Christ. So continuing now in verse 11, he says, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, we had a good turnout here today. How many of y'all thought it's a nice Sunday morning? Let's, uh, let's round up the family. Let's put them in the, in the family truckster, you know, and let's head to church and talk about circumcision. Let's, <laughs> circumcision, yeah, see? Just keep saying it, circumcision, right? I don't even want to say it, right? But here we are. We're in church. It's in the Bible. We're going to talk about it, right? So uh, Paul explains, first of all, that being filled with Christ, number one, it means that our sin nature has been dealt with. Okay, for this, for this group and, uh, of, of young believers here, this pressure is to adopt all these Jewish customs, right? And, and for them, circumcision is the biggie. That's the one that matters the most because you couldn't receive all that God had for you if you didn't have this because this, this, man, this is a special thing for us. It proves you belong to God and you want to belong to God, right? So you're going to need this. But as Paul has been saying, verse 9 and 10, all of Christ is, all of God is in Christ, and, and you have all you need in him. If he's all you need, circumcision isn't going to make a difference one way or another. And that's exactly what it says. If you take notes, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, it doesn't matter, male, female, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter you know, if you're circumcised or not. All that matters is that by grace alone, through faith alone, and what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, that's what matters. When you have that, you have all that you need, and that is proof that you belong in him. You, you belong to God once you have that. That's what you need. And so for those who are implying you need to follow this more Jewish style of Christianity, Paul says, are you kidding me? Christ has done the most Jewish thing there is. Because in him, and that's this picture that's throughout this chapter, is just this, I'm a visual guy, you know, that's why we had this illustration last week. It's, it's being in him. And if we're in him, man, he has spiritually circumcised us. And so the circumcision without, made, excuse me, with hands, it cut away, to be a little visual, it, it cut away a bit of the flesh, and it renders that little bit of flesh lifeless, right? But through the spirit, spiritual, the circumcision made without hands, as Jeremiah 4 says, 4 verse 4, the circumcision of the heart, we, when, when that happens, we say goodbye, not to just a little bit of the flesh, but we, we put off that whole old fleshy lifestyle altogether. We're saying goodbye to that. That old us is put to death, verse 12, first part of verse 12, it's buried with him in baptism. When we're submersed in Jesus, that's what baptism means, when we're submersed in Jesus, when we place our lives in him, our sin nature is put to death. And this is the picture 
that we live out through baptism. If you hung around last week when we were baptizing folks, that's what we talk about, man. It's a picture of laying to death the old man, right? He's gone with Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He's done. And so Paul doesn't, says, you don't need to be circumcised. You need to be baptized. You need to be in Jesus. Because the same way that circumcision removed part of the flesh and rendered it lifeless, at the cross, he takes our entire sin nature and puts it to death. It's laid to rest, buried with him in baptism. Now, this is good news. You may have heard this before. Jesus, uh, we're laid to death in him, but he didn't stay dead, amen? He was raised again. And so just as in Christ, the old nature is put to death, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also, man, if we're in Christ, raised with him through faith in the working of God, not yours, in his, who raised him from the dead. So being in Christ, number two, but being complete in Christ means you're given a new life in him. When you place your faith in Jesus, you, you put away the former life that sought to... It's just selfish, right? We just live for self, just kind of almost this animalistic thing and, and just whatever you know, we want to do. But we've been raised to, to new life, uh, Romans 6 tells us. We've been raised to this newness of life. And uh, as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, that once this transaction takes place, if 2 Corinthians 5 says, from now on, we regard no one to the flesh according to the flesh. If anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, they've passed away. But behold, all things have become new. Okay? That's what we have when we're complete in Christ, is, is, is that is done away with. Number three, in Christ, he said, the third thing is you're completely forgiven. Verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Without Jesus, if you're here this morning or, or watching online or listening later, whatever, if you are without Jesus, you are dead in your trespasses and sin. You might be physically alive here this morning. Your heart might, you maybe went for a run this morning. You may be in tip top shape, but spiritually, you're dead. Your sins have separated you from God. I'm not trying to be mean. It's just the reality that we've all, you know, those who've accepted Jesus have come to grips with. We're just, we're just physically dead. That we have sinned, and that sin keeps us from God, and we have no hope of eternity on our own. 1 John 5 says, He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son does not have life. And so this morning, if you're, if you're trying to be right before God, make yourself righteous without Jesus... It's lifeless. There's no hope. Charity works at a funeral home. We've seen some corpses. Not so much chance you have all on your own. There's just nothing. Just stone cold corpse. That's all the chance you have in and of yourself. Unable to do anything positive about your, your uh, situation. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and therefore he is the life. And so when we choose to turn from our sin and in faith give our lives to Jesus by God's grace through that, he deals with our old sin nature and then he makes us a new creation. He brings life into us. And it says here, what he's done is he's forgiven all your trespasses. I like that. <laughs> it's not some, it's not most, it's all your trespasses. And again, I don't know who I'm talking to, but in a group this size, there's, there's always some. Maybe you're hanging on to something. Man, this can't be forgiven. Maybe it's something you can't even forgive yourself about. I'm telling you, my friend, he's forgiven all your trespasses on the cross at Calvary. There isn't one of them left. And you might be thinking, but you don't know me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know that. How could Jesus possibly forgive me? How could that even happen? Verse 14, he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, against you and I. It was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way. And I love this vivid picture, having nailed it to the cross done away with. How are my sins forgiven? How does that happen? How does that transaction even take place? How is forgiven possible for me? When Jesus went on the cross of Calvary, all the handwriting of requirements, he says, he's talking about the law. 
Every way that you and I have broken God's law, we violated what God, the instruction God has given for our life. When Jesus was there on Calvary, he, he took our sin and that was crucified with him. And with him then was everything that separated us from God. It was crucified in him. And so instead of verse 13 being dead in our trespasses, verse 14 tells us our trespasses have been killed. They're crucified. When we are in Christ, we share what is accomplished through his death and in his resurrection. And as, uh, again, verse 10, what did it, back to verse 10, what did it say? Jesus is head over all principality and power. He's head over all the authorities. So he's dealt with it in death and resurrection, and now we just join in everything he's accomplished. And since that's the case, he's head of our principality and power, we're free from the enemy's control over our life. Look at verse 15. This is great. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Not only, guys, if we've placed our faith in Jesus, are we dead to our sin nature, we've been made alive in Jesus, and we've been forgiven and fourth, Jesus has disarmed the enemy. I know this is just as basic as can be, but to disarm means to take and remove the weapon from the, the one that wants to harm, correct, right? Whether that's a knife or a nine millimeter, whatever. If they're disarmed, you've taken away that thing that can harm you, okay? What does the enemy use as a weapon in your life? What does he attempt to use? What's his weapon to try to harm you with? It's sin. He wants to use sin. Our sin, your sin, my sin is his weapon. And so what does he do? He says, man, you messed up this time. <laughs> wow, you thought you were forgiven? Wow, what type of person, man, thinks that? What did you just think? <sighs> man, how far have you digressed? Thought you were a good Christian, going to church, having those thoughts, you kidding me? Man, what if, you're, what if your husband knew you had those thoughts? Man, I thought, you can't kick that addiction? Come on now, man, don't you, didn't you hear the pastor? He says, Jesus inside of you, you have all that, and you can't kick that addiction? Are you even saved? You might as well just keep living in sin. The enemy uses all of that as his weapon. And he shoots those fiery darts at us over and over and over and over again. Man, we got to give those away. But if we have Jesus, our sin, all of that stuff that's against us, the enemy's weapon has been removed. If we confess it, we give it to Jesus and trust that he has, in him it has been nailed to the cross. The enemy is then rendered weaponless. He has no weapon formed against you will stand. Jesus has taken away the, en the enemy's weapon. And here it says, he's made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, okay? This is a very specific word for us, this triumphing is actually comes from Roman culture. And uh, the triumph was a parade, like a, kind of like a tick tape parade, maybe for a, you know, celebrating a champion. And so the highest honor bestowed upon a Roman general was a victory parade uh, after battle in his honor. And so he would kind of lead this procession and his troops, and they'd march through Rome, and then he would display as they go through, here's the captives, here's who was defeated. And they would be shackled, and they would be unarmed. They didn't have a single weapon, and in fact, they'd be stripped naked bare. And so if you just picture that like very real thing that happened in Rome, right? Those captives... At one time, they were a threat. They, they, were, they maybe posed a very real danger to the citizens, but now they're powerless. They're shackled, they're stripped, they're disarmed, they've shed all of that. Why? Because of this victorious general. And so Paul is drawing this comparison to this picture that they know very well, and he says, Jesus is our victorious captain. He's the captain of the Lord's army, and he secured this victory at Calvary. And because we're following the Lord's leading, we also walk in that victory. And now this enemy is no longer a threat to you. You don't have to be afraid of him any longer. 
Okay, so Paul is just laying all this out. This is deep theological stuff. And, and these things are true for every single person that's placed their faith in Jesus. And, and, and so Paul's like, what else could you want, man? Our, our sin nature has been dealt with. We've been given new life in him. We're completely forgiven. Then the enemy is impotent. Like, what else could you possibly want? And so since all those things are true, verse 16, here's what it means. Of all the, to silence all those voices and all those threats to the simple gospel. He says, let no one judge you. Don't let anybody pass judgment on you when it comes to, and he lists off these things, food or drink in regard to festivals, new moons or Sabbath. Verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. And so the first voice that he silences here is, is the legalist. They're putting this heavy trip on the believers. Got to get back to eating like this, drinking like this, following that religious holiday and all of that, this new moon. And Paul says, don't put up with it, man. He just shoots them straight. It's not, let's hear them out. Let's see. Maybe they make some valid points. He says, no, let no one pass judgment on it. Don't put up with that. Man. Skip all that guilt and shame that people are trying to put on you and focus on Jesus. That's what you need to do. So the Old Testament festivals, the sacrifices, the regulations, all of that stuff, they all point to, they're all shadows, they're all pictures of Jesus Christ. And we could go completely through every... The Bible tells us that the volume of the book speaks of him. All of this stuff, it points to Jesus. Every single thing does. And so, for example, just this past week was Yom Kippur, just a couple days ago. It's the Day of Atonement. It is the most holy day in the Jewish calendar. And Leviticus 16 gives the instructions for Yom Kippur, for the Day of Atonement. And some of you guys might be familiar with that, but two goats, identical goats, would be brought to the priest, and then they'd cast lots, kind of like rolling dice, to see the fate of each one. And the first one he, that, that goat, was sacrificed on behalf of the people. And then they, they'd capture some of the blood and then they'd sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat, right? They'd sprinkle the blood. And it, it was symbolically saying that, that, you know, this satisfies God's, life is in the blood. And so this satisfies the righteous requirements that God has. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is a big deal, right? And this satisfies God's requirements. The second goat, a lot of you guys probably know this, the second goat is called what? The scapegoat. And again, such a visual thing uh, with the, the, the children of Israel spread out there. The high priest would place both his hands on the head of the second goat and he would start confessing the sin of the people. And, uh, and he would uh, just, you know, well, the people have been involved in this, and they've done that. And the worshipers that are watching this, they're thinking about their own sin. It's like, I have had those thoughts. I have struggled with addiction. It happened back then, too. All of that stuff, man, I, I, I'm dealing with this. But, man, the, you could almost picture the imagery is like, oh, but the, there's that, just that burden is taking, I've been living with this, but it's symbolically now going on this, and I'm just, I'm free from that, right? And then they would take this goat and intentionally bring it like as far away as they could out in the, you know, the most desolate part of the wilderness and say, man, there goes the sin, and it will never come back again. It's gone forever, okay? Pretty cool festival event. All of these Old Testament practices, like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they're pictures of Jesus, they, they, uh, Jesus is both goats. He's the sacrificial goat and the scapegoat. He paid the price for our sin. He satisfied God's righteous requirement, but he also has taken our sin away, never to be dealt with again. And so every single one of those practices are shadows, he says. Man, they have the shape and the form of the real thing, but it's not the real thing. Shadows only exist because there is something real and substantive that it represents, right? Now, I have a picture here um, from just like two years ago or something, maybe. <laughs> Isn't that haughty? Man. <laughs> Dang. Okay, so I've got this picture, gorgeous picture. It's a beautiful representation of an incredibly beautiful woman. But how crazy would it be if I took that picture? I'm so, baby, man, I love you so much. I can't wait to get away with you. Like, oh, and I got to dinner and just set it across, across the table. Like, this is amazing. Aren't we having a good time? Take it home. Love you. A little PDA there. That's okay. It would be so asinine for me to do that. 
when the real thing is right there. I want the real thing. And so Paul is saying, all this other stuff, it's, it's great. It's just a picture. Don't settle for the picture. Go for the real thing. And so don't let the legalists judge you. Man, those things had a purpose. They really did. But now you have the real thing. And so now, so he addresses kind of the, the legalists. And now in verse 18, Paul addresses the ascetics and the Gnostics. He says, let no one cheat you. And again, this is a powerful word that we'll probably talk about uh, next week as well. But it means, to, it means to, to say you're disqualified, to rule against you, okay? Don't let anybody cheat you. Don't let anybody say you're disqualified from your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshy mind. Now, there's a, there's a lot there. It's like, man, this is some stuff, right? But I think in these verses, Paul is addressing something that was a very specific threat to the church in Colossians, but I also know, that may be, but I, but there, I also know there's nothing new under the sun, okay? There was something specific there, but man, there's nothing new, and there's always going to be those who say, your way of thinking is outdated. Here's a deeper truth, right? We see it all the time, I, on the way here every day, I see a sign that science is real. You know, like, who's denying that? First, you know, love is love. Water is life. Kindness is everything. It's not illegal to be human. All this, like, okay, where's the, where's the real knowledge? But there, oh, no, this is something deeper. You don't get this level of knowledge. <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's, this is the world we live in. Uh, like early last year, someone, you know, my black daughter was basically told that when she said all lives matter, she's being a racist. That is some deeper level of thinking than I get, okay? <laughs> to say all lives matter is racist. And Paul, he just strips back the facade and says, would you look at this, how empty this is? Would you look at that? They take delight in false humility. They love to appear selfless. They imply, oh, we have an inside track on being righteous and, and being a better human being. But Paul says, it's all a smokescreen. Don't let anybody cheat you. Don't let anybody say you're disqualified. All that, he says, comes from this puffed up, fleshy mind. Thinking about flesh, the things of the flesh. Nothing spiritual, right? Because why? They're disconnected from what really matters. Verse 19, and not oh, man, they got this puffy, fleshy head, and they're not holding fast to the head. <laughs> Capital H, the head, Jesus, from whom all the body, that's us, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. I love this. How does a church grow? With the increase that's from God. It's not from programs or any of that stuff. Man, it's from God. And how does he grow it? By knitting the church together, by ministering one to another, nourishing each other, and course, being connected to the head. There are those that are going to say, oh, there's all these other ways to grow, but there is no life, zero life when they're disconnected from the head. So he says, just stay together, stay connected to Jesus, verse 20. Therefore, and here's this, just this picture again, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, if you've identified with Jesus, if you've died with him, if you've made a lie with him, if your sins are forgiven and the enemy is powerless against you, then guess what? Your life isn't defined by rules and regulations and doing this and doing that. It's defined by the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what he's after. Have your life defined by the power of the resurrection. And since it is defined that way, verse 20 continues and says, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? And then Paul kind of quotes these other voices that are out there and mocks them. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and the doctrines of men. He says, you don't need to subject yourselves to the doctrines of men. You're beyond all of these things because you're not living according to do, do, do this, don't do that, do this. You're living according to the power of the resurrection. These things, verse 23, finally, 
indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. I love the terms here, self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of, catch this, no value against the indulgence of the flesh. I've been caught by this too, but sometimes it seems like those who are more legalistic follow this rule, follow that rule, do this, don't do that. It comes across as, well, they're more committed than I am. Oh, yeah, look at all these things that I'm doing and you're not doing. Self-imposed religion here, he says, has the appearance of wisdom. It really does. But what is it? It's powerless. It is absolutely powerless. You can have guidelines for your life, all sorts of self-imposed doctrines and commandments and rules and regulations and this rule and do this and don't do that, but no amount of those will ever give you the power to overcome your flesh. The law does not do that. That only comes, that power comes through the power of the resurrection in your life. It's Jesus, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, amen? And that's what we want, that's what we have to remember, and that's the message we have for this world that's trying to tell us all this other garbage. Let's pray.